for joining me for another edition of This Old Gibson. I'm Scott, and this is a 1966 Gibson LGO made in Kalamazoo, Michigan. 1966 was a great year for rock and roll. The Beatles had Day Tripper. Remember that one? Anyways, uh, the Beach Boys, Good Vibrations, and the Trogs had a tune called Wild Thing, which is still around today. I mean, people love those old tunes. Um, this guitar is very interesting. It's going to need a neck reset, and I want to get started by showing you something special about this guitar up here at the nut. Let's take a look. This is how they always come in when they need a neck reset. The saddle is decked down all the way to the bridge pretty much. This one measures at 0.9 millimeters of elevation above the bridge. Geez, 0.5 over here. <laughs> it's pretty much flush with the bridge. We got a good height on the bridge. This string is actually setting on the bridge. That is so weird. Uh, so <laughs> that ain't right, guys. We want to get this saddle up three three millimeters, uh, protruding above the bridge. And I'm gonna put some new strings on it so we can really get a gauge of how this guitar is supposed to sound and look here because I need to make some calculations before I, uh, and measurements before I take the net up, neck off. I need to measure how much material to remove during the neck reset process. And that is done by determining how much we want to lower the saddle to get proper action at the 12th fret. So new strings and a new saddle coming right up. So most guitars have like 42, 43 and a half um, millimeter nuts. This one has 39.9 millimeters. So it's, it's a good three millimeters thinner at the nut. And the reason that I find that attractive for, for, the, for my personal playing is like um, Merle Travis and Doc Watson had, they had man hands. They could just wrap their thumb right around if they needed to, you know, do a B chord like this. There's a song that Merle Travis does that has an E. And he hits that G sharp up here, that major third. He plays it like that. He always plays his B like that. He plays his A like this. Sometimes he does an E7 like this. time doing that on regular necked guitars but it's easier for me on a guitar like this and if I capo it it becomes even shorter scale and, and easier to do those types of uh, Travis picking songs it's the cording Travis cording that I'm trying to look at some more normal width guitars this is a Les Paul special it has 43.25 millimeters yeah here is a PRS Silver Sky. It measures in at 42 millimeters. And the reason I don't talk in fractional inches like a lot of guys is it gets too confusing. You know, whether it's 1 in 23 30 seconds or 1 in 11 16 versus 1 in 43 64 or 1 inch in 21 30 seconds. Those numbers don't register in my head as which one's bigger than the next. But with millimeters, it's cut and dry. You got 40, you got 39, 41, 42. It's obvious which one's bigger and wider and which one's smaller. So that's why I'm talking millimeters. And last, we'll look at the guitar I got started on back in 1985. My first good guitar was a Fender Lead II from 1980. And I played Iron Maiden, Black Sabbath, Judas Priest on this thing. Maybe a little Queen's Rec, Motley Crue. And uh, it measures in at 40 millimeters 40.2 so 40 pretty much 40 millimeters even it's just like the LG1 that we're going to be working on today and that's why I think I'm so attracted to the LG1 and the lead 2 is because I started out on it that width as a kid as a teenager sorry for calling this an LGO in the opening scene this is an LG1 uh, the LGO had a mahogany top and no sunburst the LG1s had a spruce top and 
the, both of those models had a ladder brace top. The LG2 is the one that has a, a, a X braced spruce top and otherwise it looks pretty much the same as this here LG1. You can see the ladder brace here. If it was an X brace you might be able to see that that piece of wood is a stick running in this direction diagonally instead of straight across. But uh, the LG O's and LG2's and LG1's, B25's, they all had this skinny nut width and that's why I get them confused. But um, we'll get working on this nut, I mean this saddle and some new strings and we'll give her a, another listen. Okay, I got my taller saddle in there. It's actually two millimeters on the treble side and three millimeters on the bass side. I just happened to have one in stock that fit. I just had to barely shape it just a little bit. But what I found is a real tone killer inside the bridge plate has a lot of damage to it. And you can see that it was originally one of the plastic bridges that had the three machine screws holding it. The machine screws would be on the inside of the guitar. And you can still see their footprint from the washers. Um, but they didn't repair the bridge plate. So I'm going to repair that because if I leave this, these ball ends of the strings just loosely floating around inside the, uh, the on the guitar top, it's, uh, it's a horrible, horrible situation to, to have doesn't vibrate correctly so we'll get that fixed first okay to fix that bridge plate what I've got here is a rigid piece of foam with a white piece of paper in a black line running down the center I've got the glad press and seal wrapped around that some tape holding it on the bottom and this is a scissor jack it's a 3x3 three three scissor jack you can get it on eBay or Amazon and I've placed the thumb wheel up here at the top because there's a brace in the way. If I, if I had it oriented this way, it, I couldn't turn this because of the other back brace down at the bottom. So um, this is the TJ Thompson method. I've showed it in another video, but I'll show it again. Now the jack is inside the guitar and I'll place the paper so that that little black line is right in the center of the bridge pin holes. So I've got it right in the orientation that it needs to be, I'll start opening it up and it'll press right up against the bridge plate. Uh, TJ likes to spray a little accelerator, uh, CA glue accelerator, the glue boost stuff on there. Or maybe he brushes it on, maybe the Stumac stuff. Um, it's okay if this blushes because it's all inside the guitar, all this filler. We're going to fill it with maple fibers. Here we go. There, it's all ready. That didn't take long at all. So now that this is pressing firmly against the bridge plate, whoops, no it's not, I can drop in CA glue and maple fibers and that'll fill all the voids. And we can sand it smooth. Now we'll have practically have a brand new sounding guitar. Okay. Okay, I'll try to speak up because I got ventilation and I'm wearing a mask. But the first thing I'll do is take some accelerator and get it in the vicinity then I'll take some hard maple fibers I got a little scoop here I might have to make some new fibers I use a rasp to collect fibers off the edge of a piece of maple board I like taking the, the edge grain it ends up having the shape of like macaroni. Actually, I wanted—I don't want to fill in these these string slots. These are nice right here. These little ramps. Those are kind of cool. But you want to take it and pack it in with the tool. Make sure it's all packed down. And then drop in the CA glue, which is the Stumac Thin. Two drops per hole.
let it soak in for a second. Give it another shot of the accelerator. The accelerator is nice, it kind of blows the sawdust out of the, or the fibers out of the bridge pin ramps, or the string slots, string ramps. And we're, we're on our way to filling the, these bridge pin holes on the bottom side of the bridge plate. It's going to work out very nice. I, I do this a lot. This is TJ Thompson's method. He shared it with us on uh, the Luth group. On, um, he actually shared it with the general public a couple years ago on his Instagram. Bridge plate repairs can really have a dynamic change in a guitar's tone. And uh, re doing it from the outside is uh, so much quicker and less time consuming than trying to replace a bridge plate. Uh, tearing out a bridge plate can be one of the hardest jobs there is, especially if you have big arms and you're trying to work inside the guitar blind pretty much. It's uh, I don't suggest doing it unless the bridge plate's totally broken apart into pieces or you know split down the middle or something. I've never taken a bridge, I've taken a few pieces out um, but they were pretty much just wanting to come out. I've never torn a bridge plate out that was, uh, you know, unnecessarily. If it's just torn up where the ball ends of the strings hit it, I just do this method. I've also done a method where I've taken epoxy putty on my hand and with a gloved hand and gone in there and smeared it into the holes and then put a maple plate over top of that and then re-drilled the holes. That works pretty good. Because the, the epoxy putty's hard and it's sandwiched in between a piece, a new piece of maple, just a thin, you know, two millimeter, one and a half millimeter piece. Real thin piece, one millimeter maple. All right, so there it is after three applications of the CA glue and maple fiber drop. Sometimes the job ends up being a little cleaner than others. You can see they're all filled in pretty good. There's a little bit of the press and seal wrap that got stuck up in there. But a little light sanding and it'll be smooth as a baby's bottom and we can re-drill the bridge pin holes. And here's a look at the repaired bridge plate. It still has a little bit of the press and seal plastic there in between the D and the G. I didn't get it all cleaned up yet, but I will. I'll be taking the strings off again. The three holes where the machine screws held on the uh, the sheet metal screws held on the old plastic bridge are still there. It don't matter that much. Okay. Here's a little sound check now. Let me turn off the fan. Let's see if we can hear a difference here. Turn off this. This bridge plate repair is the single most greatest bang for your buck that you can ever get out of a guitar repair. I mean, I, I, I really love doing a neck reset for people and I love fixing that bridge plate because it just... It allows the top to vibrate the way it was supposed to. Okay, here's my new saddle. Decent break angle, good height, not too high. It's not a half inch. The strings are not a half inch above the body, which is like the maximum I would ever want to go. They're a little bit in between like three eighths to a half inch. They're like seven sixteenths. And I lied earlier about the action on the high strings. They were actually, it actually had five sixty fourths action on the high E, which is a little uncomfortable for me. But now it's really, with this new taller saddle, it's sent the action off into the stratosphere. We've got 9 64ths at the 12th fret on the bass strings and 8 64ths right here. That's 1 8th of an inch. Well, I'm not going to be able to play any of those Merle Travis chords with the action this high, but you can hear the difference. See, I can't play it. But hey, 
anyways, we got sidetracked. We did a huge major improvement to the sound. So is it worth doing a neck reset on? Yes! I did that other video about the X-Brace and people, someone was like, man, those ladder brace guitars sound like shit. You gotta X-Brace them all up, man. It makes such a difference. You know, you gotta look inside to see if there's something else going on. You could have a loose brace. You could have a damaged bridge plate in that ladder brace guitar that's making it sound like crap. This guitar sounds good. I can feel the vibrations against my body. It's vibrating good. I like the sound. I love the skinny neck. I just gotta get this action down so I can play it. Intonation sounds pretty good. Let's reset this neck. Okay, so here are the measurements I took. In an ideal situation, to get the action I want at the 12th fret, I would lower the saddle 5 30 seconds of an inch, which is 0.1563. The length of my heel from the fretboard down to the bottom of the heel along the side of the guitar, the top of the guitar, is 3.5 and the distance from the 12th fret, or the neck, neck to body joint, which is the 14th fret, the center of the 14th fret to the leading edge of the saddle is a, pretty much 11 inches, 11 and a 30 second or whatever. So this times this divided by that, I get 0 0.0494 of an inch, which is 1.25 millimeters. So the 1.25 millimeters will be measured out here and marked and then we will remove the material from the heel 1.25 millimeters tapering to nothing up here at this end so we're going to take away a wedge piece and that's going to kick the neck down this way I'm exaggerating but it's going to come this way once I remove that material setting the action much lower it'll also create some fall away at the uh, fretboard extension on its way towards the saddle before scoring the line around the neck to body joint, I'm brushing on straight up a lacquer retarder. Score that line, it won't chip and crack. It'll, it'll be more softened and more pliable. So I can slice right through it. We want to slice because to slice would be nice. This, uh, you know, they, they fit the neck to the body and then they spray a thick coat of lacquer <clears throat> back in 1966. They like to lay it on real thick of uh, old nitro. I want to reamalgamate that, get it to wake up and keep it from chipping. And I might want to remove the pickguard. Not too sure right yet. Let's see how it goes with uh, when I detach the fretboard extension from the body. I'm going to use this heat stick to try to pull the neck. But before I heat it up and uh, do that, I'm going to use it as my fret puller also, my fret heater. I got a new tool. Next, I score the lacquer, the neck to body joint. Gonna try to keep it from chipping. It's thick. Oh, baby. Oh. Hey. Look at that. Hey. Whoa. It's my first time using this tool. Oh. Okay. 
take it easy. We got a picker that uh, isn't really adhered very well. Comes right up. So, that kind of helps in the process of getting the knife in around the edges. But they really, really screwed up when they re glued that with that crap. A little de glue goo. It's fully separated. No problem. Took a lot of heat. Some people like to put a just a, put a little palette in palette knife in there and just let it chill so it doesn't so it cools off and uh, you see steam coming off that it's still hot so that way it won't re-stick itself self down you know, while I get ready for the next step let it cool off. Okay, this is the shape of the dovetail. But I don't want to actually drill into it. I want to leave it as pristine as possible. I want to warm up the sides here. So I'm going to drill holes at six millimeters from the edge in the 14th fret. And again, I don't want to damage the neck block of the guitar. So I want to drill into this area right behind the dovetail that's an open space. So I'm going to go 10 millimeters here and 10 millimeters from the edge over here. That should get me into that air pocket where I'm not drilling into wood. Right here I'm probably going to be drilling into some wood, but I'm just going to use electric probes there to, uh, to warm that up, and they're very small holes. 